Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the 2021-2022 season is over for the Calgary Flames. And just like Daryl said for the players, we're going to be leaving with our chests out and our chins high. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And I guess we're here to break down the the second round of the playoffs, Matt. Yep, the last two games. And then look a little bit ahead to see what's coming up. Well, instead of doing what we usually do and breaking these down game by game, we don't think it's probably worth doing that here. I'm sure by now everyone knows where we're at. But let's talk a little bit about game five. And most importantly, I guess, you know, the Flames back on home ice. Some of what we we're talking about with, with that game and probably also the, the big news there, the Coleman kick in goal. And why don't we start with that Coleman kick in goal? Because I think that's where everyone's mind still is. Um, yeah. Matt, let me ask you, was there a definitive kicking motion by Blake Coleman? Well, the thing is, is that the NHL changed their rules to basically free up, you know, the definitions of kicking motion to allow more goals to be scored. And over the last two or three years, virtually no goals have been called back for kicking the puck in. And, like, you can just look on YouTube or anywhere with hockey highlights for kicked-in goals, and, like, you can see like players literally punting it in the net and that's okay. So why the definition of a kicking motion, which had been constant for several years, all of a sudden in a definitive game breaking moment in a series gets changed without any explanation is a little mystifying. I saw three angles on that goal. In one of them, I can sort of maybe see it looks like he's kicking it in. But from that same angle, it looks like the puck was already going on the back of the net. So even if he didn't put his foot there, it looked like the trajectory of the puck was already going inside the goal line. So I really don't see how it matters either way. But I I can't see that as kicking it. I mean, you know, I I have an elderly uncle who shuffles around. If that's kicking, then my uncle's kicking every time he moves his feet. Yeah, it's one of those things that... Like, did he direct the puck in? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, like, his pu- the puck hit his leg, and he did turn his ankle to... Which, by the rule, is not against the rules. No, and that's exactly the point. And, like, for, like, all the replays that of any other goal throughout the last few years, like, you know, there was a goal or a game against Winnipeg where literally the Nate Thompson kicked the puck out of the air past Markstrom and that counted and yet you know slightly turning your ankle as you're falling in towards the net as the puck's already going in isn't allowed and it's like um objectively like you can't change the rules on the fly and you know like especially Coleman like had he known that the if he touched it with his leg, that it would have uh, been called off. I'm sure he would have just dropped to his knee and let the puck hit his shin and, you know, guided it in or just let it roll in as it was going in. And yet, like, it doesn't make any sense why the league, like, both the referees viewed it as a good goal. Edmonton didn't challenge the play. They didn't go upstairs. Toronto called calgary to overturn the play and it's at that rate of well why are you a interfering in a game when literally nobody objects to the play and then b not give any explanation for why you turned it over like you know like to me like it makes entire sense that edmonton went on to win this game because it's like, well, what if we shoot the puck on the net and the goalie misses it? You'll they'll just wave it off, like, because we're just making things up now. Well, yeah, probably a bit of a deflated Flames team at that point. You know, because it's like you worked all this hard for the whole third period to get a chance in, and the Flames played a very good third period and were putting pressure continually on until that they scored and. Like, to me, like, with how the league interfered there, 
like in a way it kind of like invalidates the whole result of the game because that was a legal goal and it's not like Edmonton wouldn't have gone on to win because they would have then had an opportunity to try and score and find the equalizer which they have done in previous games both in our series and in the LA series but they weren't given the opportunity to win it fairly and Calgary was kind of just reeling the entire rest of the game until McDavid finally ended it and you know and like I don't have any illusions that like oh well the Flames magically would have went on to win the game six and seven and that it could have happened but it's like it the league kind of just like removed the ability for the teams to actually play the game on the field and like it kind of negated the results and say here Edmonton you won I think one of the things you just mentioned is interesting. That's the idea that neither team called for review, but the, what are they called? The war room in Toronto called and said, we're going to review this. Like to me, if nobody on the ice or playing the game is too worried about it, why should Toronto be like, if you trust your officials and you say, okay, the officials on the ice said it was in Calgary didn't challenge it. Edmonton didn't challenge it. Let's just let it go. You know, from my seat in the, crowd like they had the refs looking at the tablet on the review and it looked like the one referee even mouthed the words that it, that looks like a good goal that's where like I, I as a fan get frustrated because it's like there's no follow-up explanation of what the nhl was talking about because if like if they could actually explain why they would called it that way you might argue with them and think like it, that's a dumb call but at least you'd have an idea of what they're thinking, what they're talking about, what anything. Instead, it's like, okay, well, Edmonton just gets the game and you guys can go home now. And it's like, but that's not how, like, an actual sport is played. You know, like, it, it, we're not professional wrestling where the result is determined in advance. Unless that's what the NHL's becoming, which, you know... <laughs> That's another argument for another day. Matt, do you think that maybe, and I mean, we saw after the Flames had their disallowed goal in 04 that, you know, changes were made and the way that they, you know, handled replays was changed. And do you think maybe the thing that comes out of this, the thing you'd at least like to see come out of this, would be sort of what you were saying is the league within, I'm just making up a number here, within 24 hours has to post a video on their YouTube channel explaining the decision when it gets overturned by the war room. Yeah, well, it's only fair with, you know, like, say a suspension. Like, they for a decade now, they've had the guy in charge of player personnel or whatever, uh, George Peros, uh, his job. He, he uh, comes out with a video saying, explaining X, Y, and Z, this is why, like, you know, the shoulder hit the head and was a direct, you know, and blah, 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 so so-and-so is getting suspended for three games. And so you have like a clear definitive, this is what, this is what, this is why we're thinking this, and this is what the penalty is. But like with this, it literally, you know, because you just look at YouTube, like there, there's a compilation video out there of kick-in goals where it's like, um, those are actual kick-ins that counted, and yet a guy falling into the net... As the puck's going in, oh, that doesn't count, and it's like there, it like that's bogus, frankly. Um, you know, like for me, like that was to me one of like I, I've been following the NHL since 1991 fully, and like that has to go in my personal top three of stupidest and blo most blown, egregiously blown calls I've seen. And that's for any team at any point. And, like, it, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, like, I'm sure that some paying fans might not want to bother going to games because, well, pff, they're just going to give it to whomever anyway. I think it hurts more because, A, it's our flames. I think it hurts more because, B, it was the go-ahead goal. If it was the first goal of the game and then it ended up 4-5, I don't think it would have hurt as much. No. Um I think a lot of these things probably go into it that make us more upset. And I think this fan base is also still stinging from the 
uh, the Marty Jelena disallowed goal in 04. Like, if this had been, say, in the New York Carolina series, and like the exact scenario, like, it would have been upsetting to see that because it throws into question literally the legitimacy of games as they're called. Because, you know, everything can be a legal play, but then all of a sudden you get a phone call and, oh, that your go-ahead goal there that might actually win you a game gets called off. And it, it's like, there needs to be more transparency, um, significantly more transparency, because, you know, it, it would be one thing, like, if Calgary was playing, like, an equal market and marketable player uh, in terms of McDavid. But, you know, like, because of the fact that they have a guy that's one of their marketable stars on the opposition, you know, like, I've, in passing, uh, listening to people that I know, like, they're, they're like, oh, well, they gotta make sure that the star gets the spotlight, and... You know, that you don't need those kind of questions even coming to mind in people's minds. Because, like my wrestling comment earlier, it kind of gets that negative connotation of, oh, well, the results already determined in advance. And that's not how sports are supposed to be. It's like an actual competition for who's best. And, you know, it just, it, Leaves a very bad taste in one's mouth. For sure. And, and I think it's something that as a fan base here in Calgary, we'll be talking about 10 years from now, 20 oh, years from now, still yeah. remembering this. But I think, you know, and, and I think Michael Backlund said it best after game five, the series was not lost in that game. The series no. lost in games two, three, and four. And so I think while it's heartbreaking and it sucks that that happened, I mean, I think that the Flames had really already – given this series up or lost this series in previous games. And that was just, you know, the icing on the cake when fans were trying to hold out hope. Oh, for sure. And like, then that's why I said, like, I have no illusions that like, Oh, the flames were magically going to come back and win. You know, like if they had held on to win game five, they probably would have lost game six just with how the previous games have had gone. And like, it would, I doubt that the flames would have played again in Calgary. And if they did, you know, like the arduousness of having to win that game too, like just from a mathematical odds point of view, like you're talking like a, maybe a t five, ten percent chance of that actually happening just on the math alone. So like a very unlikely scenario, but it, it's like casting a whole bunch of, you want to go out on BS. your own merits, not go yeah. out with a cloud of uncertainty. Yeah, because it, it's just a lot of unnecessary storylines that do not need to be there. Because now, you know, it's like, oh, well, if the Oilers beat the Avalanche, oh, well, they only got there because of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's not fair to the Oilers. Like, if they actually did beat Calgary in a proper way, then, you know, and they go on to the Stanley Cup Finals, well, good for them. But it's like, oh, well, the league kind of hel helped you out there to get there. And maybe they're helping you out against the Avalanche, too, just because they want McDavid to win a cup. And it's like, that's not the type of storylines that anybody needs. And no. yet, you know, like, that's not marketable to the game. You know, like, say the Oilers go on to win the Stanley Cup. That's going to be a, something that's going to be discussed. Because, you know... Creates an asterisk for the 2022 Stanley Cup. Yeah, and that's not necessary for us, for Edmonton, or for the NHL itself. So that's why it's like frustrating from each angle as like a fan of the sport. You don't want to see situations where like easily avoidable controversy could have been if they just explained it. Or, you know, just allowed the goal to happen because it was a legal goal based on three years of past reviews, but it is what it is. And, but know. I think, I think, you know, you've made the point and, and I agree with you that this probably was not the difference in the flame series. And no. as much as we're, as much as we're sad about it, we have to remember that, you know what? The flames had probably already lost the series. And while game five, I thought was a good game from the flames. Um, 
You know, in this series, they never dictated the play in any game. They didn't do any of the things that made them who they were this season. They got out checked. They got out depth. They got out goaltended. And Markstrom really struggled in that second round. Like the Flames did not play the play the way the Flames the way they, the Flames did not play the way the Flames needed to. That was a tongue twister for me. And I think, you know, as much as his fans we don't like it, they got what they deserved. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And, you know, full credit to the Oilers for moving on. It's, I'm just frustrated for them, frankly, that they had to win in a kind of BS way. You know, because, like, they weren't even given the opportunity to come back in Game 5 or put us out of our misery in either Game 6 or 7. You know, like, their ability to dictate the play was also removed from their hands because... See, yeah. and while I know where you're going, Matt, I would, I don't maybe look at it as extreme as you do. We went to overtime. Yeah. It could have been anybody's game. The others beat us fair yeah. and square in overtime. Like we, oh, I know. I, I would say that we gave them the chance to beat us in overtime based on the way the Flames played on that. Like I think, oh, yes, yeah. there was controversy there, but it's not like you know that controversy was the you know the difference between the Oilers losing and winning. I think the Oilers still won that game. It, it's I don't want to say fair those... and square, but they still took their time and won that game. Oh, no. they. How do you say? It's because of the fact that situationally, you play the game differently if you're down 5-4 versus you're tied. And because you just defensively, like, you're not pinching to get the equalizer. So, like, literally the whole flow of the play from the, the go-ahead goal, air quotes... Uh, forward is significantly different and the rest of that regulation period was completely different because of the situation being different and that's where it's like yeah the Oilers did their job especially in overtime and you know full credit to them but it's like the game itself at the time of the the goal being called back was not no longer a valid in my opinion result because the game did not go on as it should have have the legal play as it has been called for years gone on and you know like full credit to the others i'm not saying like that they weren't better than the flames throughout the rest of the game but it's just you know from that whole point of view it's like the game itself got taken away from both teams in how it, because of the off ice interference and they had to play a different game than they should have. Anything else about the uh, kicked in goal we want to chat about before we move on? Uh, not really. Just feel bad for Coleman because uh, I'm sure he would have just dropped to his knee and let his leg carry it over or he would have jumped out of the way and let the puck just roll in. And it's just really unfortunate for him that, you know, the league intervened, you know, and basically screwed him out of a, a potential game-winning goal on that. Yeah, I don't disagree, but we are where we are, and the Flames are not playing anymore. And um, yep. it's, I, I guess, you know, I, I've we're, we're recording this Sunday night, so we've had some time now as Flames fans to think about this and process this and go back and forth on it. And, you know, Matt, as a Flames fan, I was sad. And I saw men yeah. in the in the stands crying as I was heading from the press box down to the, the media lounge. Like, I saw guys sitting in the dome crying. And I think the fact that we lost to the Oilers makes that sting even worse. It's rubbing a little bit more dirt yeah. in the wound. But... The way the Flames played this round, I mean, they, they really didn't deserve to move no. on. No, no, they didn't. And it, so as much as they we're... They played terribly in the... That, you know, that and if, it, if they'd played great and it was game seven and that, you know, kicking goal was the final goal in game seven, I think I'd feel very differently right now. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm not arguing. It's just... Um, yeah, it... it it's just one of those situations that like, it's just frustrating because it didn't need to happen in the first place. And, you know, and even if they had cleared it up the day after that would have been fine, but nothing. 
Matt, do you feel like the Flames won this series? Do you feel, or sorry, do you feel like the Flames lost this series? The Oilers won this series, or a little bit of both? Um, I think that the Flames mainly lost the series more so than the Oilers winning the series. Like, how would you say McDavid's going to get points regardless? And you know, like in the last two games, they really did limit him and his offensive chances. Uh, except for the game winner in overtime. But um, the, the thing is, is that, um, like, the Flames, like, in game uh, three, where they gave up the four goals, uh, four of the same goal on, like, really inept defensive play, like, that was basically the first time all season that we saw that level of tire fire level of defense all year. And, like, they were all, you know, self-made, unenforced errors. And it's like, if the Flames weren't playing with their head in the clouds, they don't give up those odd man chances, and then maybe the Flames actually win that game. But instead, you know, they, you know, like, yes, credit to the Oilers for capitalizing, but... It's one of those, like, if we didn't screw up to the extent that we did, then the Oilers wouldn't have had their chances to, you know. And, like, the just the defensive play by the Flames was just horrendous throughout the series. And I think, you know, for me, when I look at this, Jake Ottinger was really the story of round one against the Flames, and in the end, they found a way to solve him. I feel like, you know, as good as Connor McDavid is, Connor McDavid took it to another level in this series, and I feel like the Flames may have just been overwhelmed by him at the beginning and never really, um, you know, never really recovered from that and were never able to really find his kryptonite. Yeah, which it's one of those things that the team itself like i i think that the five games that they played were five of if not the five worst defensive performances that the team had all year and i think that perhaps psychologically just you know having to throw everything in the kitchen sink to beat dallas it mentally tired them out or something um because like just the amount of basic mistakes that they were making that like they hadn't all year and you know allowing mcdavid to come in off the rush and like trying to get in on a man-on-man to the extent when they weren't even doing that during the regular season like it it just it was just bad (laughs) all the way around by the flames like there's no sugarcoating it it was a very bad series by calgary i would agree with your Observation: I think the Flames lost this series more than the Oilers winning it. And maybe I'm, you know, I'm not trying to undervalue what the Oilers have done. Maybe I am a little bit by saying that. But I think that the Flames came into this. I mean, if you remember back at the beginning of the season, a lot of analysts predicted the Oilers to go far. And, you know, maybe they're, and the Oilers, I think, have had a rough year as well. I mean, they lost for a bit. They changed coaches. Credit to their new coach. He's really turned that team around in how they play and their structure. But I just think that this was the Flames series to take if the Flames played their game. And I would say that, you know, even in game five, which I thought was probably their best game, we didn't see the Flames play their game for 60 minutes at all in the series. No. And, like, frankly, I thought the Flames were the better team in game two for most of the game and the better team in the second and third period in game four. And could have easily won both of those games had you know um more attention to detail like especially in the third period in game two and you know like if the flames had won one or both of those games we're talking about a completely different you know like we're literally talking about what happened in game six and seven instead of you know and it's one of those things where like, Calgary was, like, all season significantly better than the Oilers. But you have to actually show up when the games matter, and this team didn't. And analyzing what the reasons for that, whether it was injuries like Tutanev or just mental focus or, 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 
you know, that will be the key for this team moving forward in this off season. But on the whole for the effort in both the first and second round, I, I feel like the flames did take a big step in the right direction because they were able to move past the first round and overcome some adversity, but there needs to be more of an emphasis of learning on how to reset yourself when, you know, you're through a situation and, you know, come back the next day and be ready to go again. And like that, that's part of why the flames have continually had difficulty with adversity in the postseason before. Cause it's like, as soon as something screws up, it's just a tire fire the rest of the way until the series is over. And, you know, for once, Calgary was able to overcome it, but then weren't able to take that next step. And that's the frustrating part. 14-15 was the last time the Flames made it to round two and also lost uh, in, in round two. In five. Matt, looking at, and I would say this is a very different team than 14-15, but looking at this team and where they ended up in the regular season, what we saw from this team, and, and knowing now how the season ended, would you say this team was a failure, a success, or somewhere in the middle, and why? Um, They took a lot of positive steps, and they still fell flat on their face. And, you know, like, they basically played... Edmonton as if it was Colorado a couple of years ago and allowed the Oilers who were nowhere near as good as Colorado was to just walk all over them for large stretches and like while the Oilers are a decent team like they had 104 points they're a legit playoff team they're not good and like they're the worst of the teams that are left by a, a wide margin and, like, frankly, I would be shocked if Colorado loses a game to the Oilers. But, you know, it, it's one of those things, though, that, like, yeah, you, you, you took a big step forward. You, you beat Goliath in the first round. And then you return to all of the bad habits, all of the inept defensive play, all of the things that for years has been the exact same problem and you know as soon as the Oilers did something oh tire fire time and you know it's like the uh second period in uh game five where you know they got up to nothing as soon as they got the two nothing lead it's like oh well now it's tied oh Edmonton's in the lead fight back get the lead again oh like five seconds later, give it back. It's like you can't stop getting in your own way. <laughs> and it's just frustrating to see this team. Like, even if they're making progress, they're not. And it's just, uh, I don't believe, I think a lot of progress made this year. I mean, you, you know, you're saying if they're making progress, they're not. And they made progress in the playoffs. I mean, remember yeah. last year they didn't even make the playoffs. And this year they're, you know, in round two. So I think, you know, it might be a little, I think we all got caught up with their great preseason, or sorry, their great season. But in the preseason, when you and I did the uh, week, the yearly predictions, we didn't think they were going to make it past second round. We both said the furthest this team can go is round two. And I think that we may have got caught up by, you know, their great regular season when we're thinking that. But I would say a lot of progress is made here. And I think when we look at this objectively and where the team was last year and where they are this year, I think it's a big ask to go from no playoffs to round three or four. Yeah, it's also... Uh, with the caveat of quality of opponents as well. And, you know, and like with like the flame, you know, like the expectation that they were going to beat the Oilers, that was just mainly because you look objectively at the quality of the two rosters and Calgary is better. So they should have one. And so therefore it's a disappointment that they didn't. But contextually on the overall yeah they got to the second round hey that's a huge step for them it's just like the 
the main frustration is having to wait another calendar year to see if they can then take that next step of getting to round three or round four. And you but know, that's like all... you know that's the way progress is made in any oh, league, and yeah, it's frustrating. But I think it also gives us something really great to look forward to. Yeah, well, to me, like um, as I was watching this series, um, it was actually reminding me of a different team entirely from a few years ago, and uh, similarly, like you know, quasi they had some veteran guys and some young guys, and kind of like all over the place, and they didn't quite live up to their expectations, and that was the Tampa Bay Lightning, and for a number of years, like they were choking and not getting there and yet we're always a good regular season team but they couldn't find the right fit and like they'd even get to the conference finals and then lose and everything was just being herky-jerky for them and then they finally actually clicked over figured out their problems and have won back-to-back Stanley Cups and are probably going to win a third one that's who I'm expecting to win by the way for the you know but uh it's a process right and, yeah and i think and i think again i like, think maybe we were looking from the shortcut that process as fans well and you have to look at like the flames defense normally defensemen don't get good like as in their developmental curve until they're 26 27 28 well you look at um hannafin and anderson like they're both 25 uh, Shillington's 25, um, you know, Valimaki's 20, going to be 23, um, Mackey's 25, like, all of those guys are really young still, and, like, they're the, I think, linchpin of this team and their future success is, and, like, you saw with the three, uh, first three guys, all of Shillington, Hannafin, and Anderson had a monumental leap forward in their offensive game all three with significantly better career highs and their two-way play significantly improved shillington needs to hit the weight room in the offseason so he doesn't get pushed off the puck as much but you know when he was uh tj brody was his age it was the same story and you know brody was able to figure that out significantly when he was, you know, 25, 26 as well. So I'm sure that Shillington, as he um, goes through his offseason, will be looking to bulk up a little bit. So to answer my question, I'm going to say this season was a success. Was it as successful as I like? No. But I think realistically, if we take all things into consideration – I'm going to say that 2021-2022 is a success, and I think we saw a lot of growth from individual players. I think we saw a lot of growth from the team and the system that we haven't seen, and they made it further than they have since 14-15 in the playoffs for a team that didn't make it last year. So yeah, would you give a success too, Matt? A huge step forward. It's like, okay, let's address the, the parts of the team that are – missing um and like let's reset for next year and let's go again well well, before we talk about next year let's talk quickly here um because it sort of fits where we are about the last of our regular seat or our preseason predictions we did our regular season ones earlier and there's still three questions that we left unanswered first one we've already talked about how far can this flames team go before the season we thought second round so i'll give us both a point for that um, who's our unexpected playoff hero? I said Matthew Lucic. You said Andrew Mangiapane. I'm not going to give either of us a point for that. Yeah, um, Michael Backlund and, and Michael Stone are the two. Yeah, I think if dancers. we had to name somebody, it'd probably be one of those guys. I think yeah. you could, in some ways, even argue Trevor Lewis. Yeah. Um, Daryl Sutter will be nominated for the Jack Adams. I said, yes, nominee. You said, if the Flames make the playoffs, he wins. Um, I yeah. still think that he's probably the coach that will end up winning that. Yeah, same here. And will Markstrom be a Vesna candidate? I think he will be a candidate, but I think especially now the Flames are out, Shesterkin's going to win. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that Shesterkin was going to win anyway, but 
because uh, like they're voted on before the first round anyway and uh yeah shesterkin's the main reason why they're in game seven so we'll see how they do tomorrow and you know i'm hoping that the rangers win just because i don't like carolina frankly <laughs> so we we will talk more about free agency and whatnot as we get closer to that that date now is july 13th this year um but, Matt, the Flames, this is the first year we've really seen the Flames in a buyer position going into the trade deadline in a long time. I mean, usually they're sellers or they're buying, but just a little bit. And they made some str- some big strategic moves this year. So I wanted to go through these trades with you. And now, with everything we know, see if you still think these are good moves or not. Do you feel like maybe the Flames, with you know 2020 hindsight, uh, maybe gave up too many assets or anything like that? Oh, yeah. So the first one was Tyler Toffoli. Tyler Toffoli was traded to the Flames on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, with, um, so sorry, he was traded to the Flames in exchange for prospect Emil Heinemann, forward Tyler Pitlick, a first round pick in 2022, and a fifth round pick in 2023. So the Flames gave up a prospect, a injured roster player, their first this year and their fifth next year. Looking back at that, do you still think that, that with everything we know and you know where we are with our draft picks right now, are you still comfortable with that deal? 110%. Um, the Flames are going to be picking in the mid-20s um, anyway. So the odds of that player becoming an NHL player are minimal. And the psychological boost of get, going out and getting a legit top six forward and someone who played like a good top six forward for most of his time here like for a good like that period where he wasn't scoring he was still generating a lot of scoring chances and especially in that first round series against Dallas he was robbed like eight or nine times by Ottinger and like he could have if he had better puck luck he would have been the star of the first round and a guy like Toffoli, uh, how would you say, he's not a super, superstar. Uh, he's just a very good middle six forward and who can score. And, you know, like there are holes to his game. Yeah, he's slower than he should be. And, and you know, his consistency is not there. But, you know, there's a reason why he's not a $10 million forward. And... You know, and the reason why we were able to get him for a first and a fifth. You know, um, I would make that trade a hundred times over. And the fact that he's a cheap, reliable top nine forward for next season uh, that you can pretty much count on for 20 goals, like that to me is a bargain, even now. And, you know, the cap certainty of him in that, that position also helps. Yeah, I think you definitely paid a little bit, A, to acquire him early, and B, to acquire that cap certainty, because he's not a rental. He'll be around with the Flames for a bit. I think Emil Heinemann will end up being an NHL player, but I don't think he'll be anywhere near a a top six on a playoff team. Um, So I still think, you know what, the Flames, they had to do what they they need to do to get that top that top winger that we said they needed. And I still think that this was a great move, and I don't believe they would have gone as far in the playoffs they did without Toffoli. No, and it, it's one of those things that, like, in order for this team to make moves to, like, be a legit contender, you need to make moves like this. It, it's sort of like Colorado when they went out and got Nazim Kadri. Like, the, they didn't necessarily need Kadri but he was a very good middle six forward for that team, and they were just able to plug and play with him and you know not have to worry about him and like next year the second line right wing spot don't need to worry about it it's done on to the next thing and you know like frankly the the entire right side of the ice for next year is done you got Kachuk you got Toffoli you got Coleman you're good you know and you, you don't need to worry about that well just to be clear we don't yet have Kachuk well it, he's a restricted free agent, and that's the main reason why, I, you know, because, yeah, it, that will get done. It's, and the other midseason deal the Calgary Flames made was to bring in from Seattle Kelly Yarncroke, 
Um, and they gave up three picks, a second rounder in 2022, a third rounder in 2023, and a seventh rounder in 2024. The seventh rounder was apparently what they had to give up in order to have the crack and eat half of his salary. I'll start with this one, Matt. I think that at the time, I mean, Yarn Crow came in and you and I both thought it was a great trade. And I think it looks even better when we lost Sean Monaghan because it's given us a stable third line center that I think we're missing. I think for me, Yarn Crook underperformed as an offensive player while he was here, but I think that he did his job as the defensive or two-way center that we needed him to be. I think at a million dollars, he'd be worth bringing back. At two million, I would probably be looking elsewhere, maybe uh, at a, a would, younger player or a guy like Ruzhishka. Um For me, um, if the Flames signed Yarn Crook for four years at two million per, fine. Done. Yay. On to the next. Um, you look at Derek Ryan, you know, he, he, in my mind was, he replaced Ryan in the lineup and like what we've been missing, that flexibility of having him playing up and down the lineup in, in a two way role. Yarn struggled mightily offensively, not scoring until the last goal for the flames this season. But, you know, it wasn't like he wasn't getting chances either. And, you know, like in the first round again at Ottinger, he had five or six really dynamite chances that Ottinger robbed them on. And, you know, it, like as much as you just look at the score sheet, zero goals. And, you know, and then not until the second round getting one. Like, yeah, okay, objectively that is bad in terms of results. But literally every other part of the job, perfect. And the flexibility of having him as a winger or as a center, like in my mind, um, of the non Goudreau and Kachuk free agents, to me, he's priority number one. Interesting. And I, I, I honestly think that the Flames were going to sign him this offseason anyway, just because he's Lindholm's cousin and friend of Mark's room and, 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 and anyway. So sounds like know. his medieval name, Kelly, cousin of Lindholm, friend of Markstrom. Yeah. Well, with an English translation of his name being Iron Hook, that totally fits. <laughs> um, well, talking about guys are going to sign, and let's not get into actual um, contract numbers. We can do no. this as we get closer to the July 13th deadline. But the Flames have a handful of guys. Their defensive core is pretty much all locked up. Um, there's a couple guys here that we need to talk about on the defensive core, but let's start with the forwards. Um, I'll go through these names and you let me know who you think they need to be bringing back. And let's do the uh, UFAs first. Johnny Gaudreau. Absolutely. Eight years, 80 million, please. Just it feels it a lot like there's a little more uncertainty now um, that Gaudreau might come back to the flames. It fell for a while like it was a sure thing. If the Flames lose Goudreau as an RFA, how big of a blow do you think that is? Um, well, frankly, if the Flames lose Goudreau, um, then this whole season was kind of pointless. Um, hiring Sutter was kind of pointless. Um, the team not just going into a rebuild last year and, you know, like trading Goudreau at the deadline, et cetera, et cetera was pointless getting to full in yarn crock was pointless so it, you know even signing markstrom at that point is pointless so like gaudreau did everything that gaudreau could and you know like it didn't help that kachuk injured himself in the dallas series and it lingered uh when he could he was good uh he did struggle a bit in the second round but you know, frankly, everybody other than the Coleman, Manjapane, and Backlund line struggled for most of that round. And it's one of those things that, you know, like if the Flames are going to take that next step into being the Tampa Bay, like they need basically Goudreau to be our Stamkos. And that reliable, good veteran guy who knows how to put up the points. And is he necessarily the main component on the team not necessarily no for now yes but you know like as years go on like uh stamkos has been a little bit overshadowed by kucherov and a few other players 
But, you know, like, the Flames need him to basically be the Steven Stamkos, you know, go out there. And the Flames also have the best flexibility and ability to pay him the most because of that being able to sign him for the extra year. And, you know, I'm sure that the Flames will probably throw 10-plus at him, which is appropriate. And, you know, like, nobody can add that eighth year. And I so, guess I'm just a little nervous, him being a UFA, that he can walk away for nothing. Yeah, and if that's the case, it will be Goudreau's decision that he doesn't want to be here, in which case, well, that's fine. you know. And, uh, and in that case, I mean, if he doesn't want to be here, you don't want him here. Yeah, but, you know, like, uh, it was Blake Coleman who, uh, he was mentioning to Goudreau that, you know, it's about your legacy as mm -hmm. well. And, you know, like, he could be revered like Jerome McGinley is mm -hmm. at the end of his contract. You know, like, if he, you know, plays the next eight years and has, like, 70-plus points in each of those years, like, his numbers, he's going to be knocking on McGinley's door step for the franchise records, all of them. And maybe not goals, but, you know, everything else. And it's one of those things that... Uh, you know, like, that's up to him, and, you know, like, does he want his jersey retired? Because, you know, if he plays here the eight years, he will get his jersey retired here. You know, because he will have been, like, one of the dominant players in the NHL his entire duration here. And, you know, like, it depends on what his priorities are. And... And you know. I, I think, you know, and again, I don't want to speculate too much. Neither of us have talked to him. We don't know. Um, but, you know, he's, I think it's that first time he gets to make that decision. He's now married. He and his wife may want to start a family somewhere else. Like, there's probably a lot more going on there that he needs to work through now than when he was in his early 20s. Yeah. Um, Let's move on to the next one here. Another unrestricted free agent on the team, um, Kelly Yarncroke. And you said you'd bring Yarncroke back for sure? Yep, definitely. It's mostly the flexibility that he can play any of the three positions. So, like, if any of the forwards in the top nine get hurt, he can literally fill in for them regardless of line. So it's literally the perfect guy to have that flexibility with. This is a and, guy for and that's where uh, like how you were saying like a million million and a half. Yes, if he was just the center, but because of the fact that he can play all three positions equally well, that's why like for me if it's 2 million per, fine, you know, just for that added flexibility, it, the extra 500,000 is worth it. This is a guy that when we were talking earlier about trades, I forgot that we'd acquired, um, which is probably bad for him. Hopefully the um, – maybe good for him if he wants to stick around, maybe bad, but hopefully management doesn't forget him as well. And that's Ryan Carpenter. The Flames gave up a fifth for him. Do you see any need to bring Carpenter back? Um, If they want him as the 12th, 13th forward, sure. But – to me, that feels like the kind of role now that we need to be promoting from the farm. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those that like or Zizka the, or Pedersen or somebody. Yeah, it's or one you're of those... waiting until um, you know training camp and you're bringing in a, a veteran guy at league minimum. Yeah, it, it's one of those where if you want to and like the, say they announce it tomorrow that they resign him, would be like, yeah, sure. But would you be like? not you know first thing knocking on his door to do that uh not really that's so, the last deal on this list that you're making yeah it, it's one of those where it, if you loop around like on say the second or third day of free agency and like you still haven't filled that fourth line center 13th forward guy I think spot, you can even come back to him on august 1st yeah probably how about trevor lewis um, no, I'd let him walk. Why is that? Uh, he played great in the playoffs and that that's fine, but it's more that the flames need to promote with, from within and there's just not enough spots. I think again, I would bring Lewis back sort of what you were saying about Carpenter to be your 12, 13, but I think the veteran leadership he brings and his relationship with Daryl is worth it, it, investing it's, in. It's one of those, if he's like the 13th, 14th forward, like Richie, Sure. 
but like if he's going to be playing a, a regular rotation, no, I don't want him back. How about Brett Ritchie? No. I think Ritchie was here because he's a Daryl Sutter type player, but I think that he looked less good than he should have in many games. And I think, I mean, the fact that he was kind of sitting out in the playoffs, I think tells you that his time in the Calgary Flames is probably done. Yeah. And it's one of those that like the Flames, if they want that player again, go find another of that player again. Like you don't necessarily need to um, go and um, spend you know, like keep the guy just because that you, you know, it, it, that's a, like, I mean, an even easier internally, I would almost rather bring up Byron Frazier to that role. It, it's one of those that you can cycle the deck chairs on that one. Like, it, cause for the league minimum, you know, like maybe putting a different guy in has a, a little bit better chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. Like it took him what, like nearly sixty games to get a goal. It, you know, like it, it's one of those where, like, he wasn't objectively bad, but he wasn't objectively good either. It's kind of one of those, yeah, I guess, but. And I know. think you and I'll agree on the two RFAs, Monjapani and Kachuk, that they both guys need to be. They need to find a way to bring him back. Yeah, um, I would. I, I think they need to find a way, but I also would not be surprised if Kachuk is not here come next season. I I think that um, I actually 100% think that Kachuk's here next year, but uh, because I he's maturing and it it's a he I think is emblematic of the flame struggles where like getting most of the way but like ne still need having rough edges and needing to learn and mature and i think that like when he gets past his you know somewhat selfishness not uh, yes and no but you know what i mean where like taking matters into his own hands against klingberg which messed up his hand you know like next year he needs to learn that you know like we have other guys to go do that and you know like his job is to put the pucks in the net and he, you know you need two healthy hands and you know not one that's bang all banged up and mangled so you know i would expect him to be back um for manjapane though i'm leery if they give him more than like four and a half million on the, like i say a five-year deal just because, like, he was really great off the hop, and then for, like, the entire second half of the season, he was kind of mediocre. And... He, He's making 4.8 right now. Oh, no, 2.45, sorry, 4.8 was the total on the contract. Like, I could see, like, a five-year, like, 4.5 to 5, you know, anywhere that's basically in the neighborhood of what Lindholm is making... Because I feel that basically he and Lindholm at the same time in their career were basically at the same spots. Lindholm, of course, progressed significantly and has emerged as like a star caliber forward in his own right. But uh, I think Eatbread has a little too many holes in his game still and still a little too much of a lack of consistency even though he's doing a lot of things really well and is a very good offensive catalyst, he just needs to, again, take another little step next year or the year after. And, I mean, we can talk about this as we get closer as well to free agency. I'm not convinced that Manjapani will be a long-time flame. Um, I think that some of those holes might move him off the team at some point, but... I think if the Flames could get him to, and I doubt they would, if they get him to sign his one-year qualifier and say, you know what, do it again, and then let's talk big money, I think that would be their ideal. Um, I think um, with the Kachuk and um, Gaudreau contracts being up, if they can get him at a reasonable rate, like even if they're, say, overpaying slightly for what he's doing right now, but they can get him for four or five years. I think that uh, just for the cost certainty, I think that would be worth it. But again, I can understand, you know, like have another like put up or shut up type year. It's just um, 
at that point, you know, from his point of view, it's like, well, you're not really being loyal to me either. And so maybe I just walk and go somewhere else. Maybe. And I mean, he's still an RFA. So, I mean, you know, he's not probably gonna, gonna walk at this point. And I guess the team has to figure out how loyal do they want to be to him? Yeah. And to me, in my mind, like he is one of the more foundational pieces in terms of well, he's a dynamite second line player. And, you know, like if the flames for whatever reason need to move on from Gaudreau or whatever, uh, um, having a guy who can score 30 goals is huge. And I think that would definitely change things. If they had to move on from Gaudreau, I think that really changes the equation. Yeah. And it's one of those things that, you know, I, I, I think that they need him even just as a, you know, you're a very good second liner and just keep him there. I think that like, there are some players that you can overpay or, you know, overcommit to, uh, in terms of years, just because like, that, you know, like the flames don't have a guy immediately coming up through the system that is ready to take that spot. You know, guys like Peltier might, but they're not here yet. And, you know, for where the Flames are in their contention cycle, like, they kind of need him to be there doing his thing. I think that you may see that he's one of the last deals done. Just because I, I think they, they want to get, they want to figure out where their other money is going to go first. Yeah, yeah I, I think he's the last guy to tell you and the truth. And then let's look on the back end here. Um the well, I guess. Uh, just to uh, add on to that uh, before we go on, it it's kind of a like let's see like where all the finances are because we might just run out of money and say hey we'll just give you one year extension for like four and a half five million because we can't go to like six or seven if you're wanting like a high dollar long term even though we might be interested per se you know. And we'll just kind of punt this for a year while we, you know, sort the Lucic Monahan back one. What's I was saying? Yeah, you might convince him to just, you know, sign a one-year qualifier. Yeah. Um, on the back end, let's start with our RFAs. Nikita Zadorov. Uh, I would like him back, but I don't think he will be. I still feel like Zadorov was a, a reactionary move to losing uh, Gu- Gu- or um, Giordano. I feel like it's like crap. We lost a defenseman quick. Let's go and get another one. Uh, how would you say the flames needed to be bigger and be- more physical? And to me, Zadorov and Good Branson each were an A plus for their contract. And it, it's just more that I don't know at this point if the flames have the dollars to keep both him and Good Branson. And Good Branson will be cheaper to keep. And both Mackie and Valimaki can play on the left side where Zadorov does. So it's kind of like if you're going to find a savings there, that would be probably the place to go, even though you don't really want to lose necessarily that. The player. only way I could really see good uh Zadorov coming back is if it goes into August, he hasn't been signed, and the Flames could then sweep him up for significantly cheaper, but I don't think that'll happen. Yeah, like, frankly, like, if the Flames could get him for, like, say, two or three years at, like, three million per, I I would be a-okay with that. And, you know, like, he, I think he was very good for, not necessarily the 375 that he was making, but he was damn close, and, you know, for what he brought in terms of the physical intimidation, which, you know, as much as, um things have changed they haven't changed all that much and a guy like Zadorov is a very good useful 5-6 for the you know making sure players are protected hitting things that move and you know that whole side of things and clearing out the front of the net and you know all that kind of stuff and I feel like, you know, the Flames, and, and well, I mean, we can talk about it, you know, as we get closer to free agency and see who's still available. But looking at the list of guys that are available as UFAs and also the fact that the Flames are going to have to probably move some bodies off this team, I feel like if you lose Zadorov, you can reacquire that position. Yeah, like, I think that, um, like, the main difference between, like, this year's iteration of the Flames' defense versus 
like the last 10 years is that the more focus on the heavy defensive side mm-hmm. and like between getting Tanev previously and then both good Branson and Zadorov, like the flames haven't really had like that level of physical defense since like they had Regeer, Commodore and Montador on the team. And so a ways back and, and uh, like guys like Warner, et cetera. And you know, like the flames, I've always felt like over the past, like basically since like Oh six Oh seven have been more focused on like offense mostly and defense as long as you know it's cheap for like the five six guys and you know not really having like that physical ruggedness and like it doesn't surprise me that like when we had Derek England playing more of a big role that we had success and that when we had those three we had more success because teams that generally are in the playoffs and going deep Like, you look at Colorado's defense, like, they have some big guys that are physical back there. You look at Tampa Bay, they have some big guys that are physical back there. Same with the Rangers, same with the Hurricanes. And it's a theme that, like, all the teams that are perpetually successful in the playoffs have those kind of guys on the blue line. And as you said, like, you know, Zadorov himself might be replaceable, but they need to get like, for sure. A, yeah. They need uh, that type Zadorov of player. guy. Yeah. And I don't know that they'll be able to spend $3 million on Nikita Zadorov, but I think that they definitely need to prioritize that role. Yeah. And I, like, I would, you know, honestly with both Mackie and Valimaki, like if they can be utilized as trade chips, that might not be the worst thing. It, because neither one, like those guys are both in the Hannafin Anderson Shillington mold of the two way type guys. And, you know, like we got three really dynamite ones. I don't think we need more of that. And I think we need just some more raw, like Yan Kuznetsov's, like, because he's that type of guy on Stockton. You know, more of that guy coming through. Well, if you're going to bring up Valium, Valimaki or Mackie, I think they're more likely to replace Zadoro's partner, who's also a UFA, and Eric Branson. Or, yeah. er, sorry, Eric Good Branson. Would, uh, would you move on from Good Branson? I want him back for three or four years. I think a lot of that's going to come down to dollar figure. Yeah, it, I think that, you know, because he's bounced around so much and because he genuinely likes playing for Daryl Sutter, that, you know, if you can sign him for two, three, four years at, say, two, two and a half, which is about where his contract is and has been for the last few years, that, you know, like, it, just like the Derek England uh, contract, like, on paper, you're like, oh, that's a little bit of an ouch, but then when you see his impact in the game, you're like, yeah. And no, he got a lot it. of negativity when he got signed. I was one of the guys who said I liked that signing. Yeah, same here, and... I think I even said that, you know, halfway through the season, everybody's going to love this player being on this team. And, you know, because he has a certain dynamic and he's not coughing the puck up like he did at times because he was trying to to do too much when he was with other teams. And he simplified his game under Daryl. And it doesn't surprise me he had an absolutely amazing season. And I think that if they can roll that over then you know and keep him for a couple more years like that would be a perfect placeholder so like the flames like they have a couple of guys that are defensive prospects but they're a ways out the flames having the three good young guys plus tanev kind of cements the top four for like the next four years anyway so if you can get some placeholders and allow some of the young guys plus future draft picks to filter in, you know, like you can kind of weave the team forward instead of like, uh, we need, oh shit, we need to go trade for his three guys at the deadline or, you know, like that kind of stuff. And the last guy on the list in 2019, Michael Stone signed a one year league minimum deal before the 2021 season. He signed a league minimum one year deal before the 2021, 22 season. He signed a league minimum one year deal. Matt, you and I have talked about, we can't get rid of Michael Stone. I mean, that seems like that might almost be the first deal done of Michael Stone is coming back on a one year league minimum. 
And the cat came back the very next day. The defenseman <laughs> came back. We just couldn't keep him away. No, uh, I, I would definitely have Stoner back. Uh, I won't yeah. sing the song. Yeah. I think, you know, again, as a 7-8 at league minimum, I'm not paying him any more in league minimum, but if he'll come play for us for league minimum at that role, I even, think he shows you know, value honestly, in the Honestly, even a million bucks, a million and a quarter, even a million and a half, if it warrants it, sure. But and I, Well, I, I just think with some of the cost uncertainty this team has yeah. right now, I don't know that you can pencil him in for more than that. Yeah, no, and... But I think he, after his playoffs, he's got to get a better look as a uh, number six. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that this is one of those where I think that Stone might have finally played his way out of Calgary because I'm sure that there will be a team that will throw a higher dollar contract at him to play like a top four role um, just because... Interesting. Yeah, you know, like if you look at Arizona, for example, like their team is a tire fire. And Stone would be a top four defenseman. That's where he came from. Team. Yeah, exactly. So, and you know, he's thirty-one. This is probably really the end of his, you know, peak earning year as a defenseman. So I know he's from Winnipeg. His wife's from Calgary. Um, they met in Calgary. He played like he, he has ties to the city. But yeah, I could also see from a personal perspective if someone's willing to pay you top four money, you know what? I'll go play there for a year or two. Maybe he comes back later. But you, I think at this point, you might have to chase the money. Yeah. And, you know, if he, with his, with his play, if he's earned himself a good contract with somebody else, hey, awesome, congratulations. Yeah, and I don't want the Flames to try and match that. I mean, if someone's no. going to pay him top four, say, you know what, Mike, go do it. Yeah, awesome, we'll be cheering for you. you know, yeah. Because he, he literally did everything that he could for this team. And, you know, if he's going somewhere else, then, hey, uh, we'll be cheering for you on that team and good for you. And, yeah, but would we lo love him back? I think that's both uh, for both of us an unequivocal yes. We would. Yep. I could even see a team like Seattle toss some money at him or Buffalo. I think he could fit on the blue lines well in a top five role. Yeah. Anybody who's rebuilding and has no illusions of playoffs, but needs a good, high quality veteran guy who's professional. You can't really go. And I think any if it wasn't for those playoffs, he'd probably be back for sure. But I think yeah. you could be right. I think the playoff performance could have uh, raised the the look of some scouts up in the press box. Yep. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much takes us to today and uh, the end of our Flames season recap. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, um, a go Colorado, go Colorado. Um, win each game eight to ten to one. You know, give give a give Edmonton a goal. You know, you can't really shut them out four in a row. Because I have uh, a friend in Edmonton who texted me. He's like, "So now that Calgary's out, you're cheering for Edmonton, right?" I said, "Nope, cheering for anybody who's playing Edmonton." Yeah, exactly. And so no, this is not Canada's team. This is still the stinky Edmonton Oilers. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, go Colorado. Kale McCarr, go win yourself a Con Smythe trophy. You know, and yeah, please beat the Oilers because they don't deserve to win the cup. You know, like McDavid's not that good. He's not Wayne Gretzky. Go away. What's the, what's the old saying, Matt? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. Colorado, you are now my best friend. Go kick their ass. <laughs> there you go. Um, Anyhow, it, hey, you showed a uh, graphic of the Flames logo with the avalanche colors. That's very appropriate. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'm hoping that Colorado wins and save that Tampa Bay. Uh, if it's Tampa Bay versus Colorado in the finals, which is kind of what I'm expecting, I'll be cheering for a three-peat just because you don't see that too often. But... Uh, yeah, uh, other than that... Uh, what about in terms of the Flames? Any final thoughts? Um, How would you say? I feel that like this team took a big uh, step forward in the right direction for their maturity level. And Daryl teaching them what it actually takes to be successful in the postseason. And uh, I think that like moving forward, this team needs just... A few tweaks, some more youth in the the 
NHL team because I think that that was part of the thing that was lacking was some speed on the third and fourth lines, you know, and just uh, come back at it. And, you know, like this is, feels very much like step one and a big step one taken. And, you know, let, let's go take step number two next and you know like that there's a lot of good things about this organization i think right at this moment and i'm hoping that gaudreau buys in and you know like we can get the band back together and go for it again and try to win that stanley cup because i think this team finally is on the right trajectory to actually having their potential and their actual being on the same page I think you're probably right. Now time for Dan's final thoughts. Run, run away. Earlier, <laughs> what's that? Run, run away. <laughs> there you go. This is where you can stop listening. Um, as I said earlier, I think that this season was a success, sort of like you just said, as that step one. It was that season under pro- a proper coach with a proper system. Guys turning a corner. I mean, we had 200 point you know, pl- players for the first time in a long time. It felt like that successful building block. But... I think you were overestimating this team if you thought they were going to go all the way to round four. And I think that as a building block, if they can build on this, if they can get the core of this team back and somehow sign them all and not see a lot of change, I think, like you said, their actual and their projected are closer than they ever have been. And I think now they know how to win. I think now they know the bitter defeat of loss. I think, you know, there's a lot to build on here. And I think... Things are only going to go up from here, but that hinges on our top two guys coming back as Calgary Flames. And if one or both of them don't, I think we need to have a very different discussion come, you know, free agent day. But yeah, as long as this core comes back, I'm optimistic that, you know what, the Calgary Flames are finally going to be a player in this league. Yeah. And like you look at um, just like organizationally depth wise, um, you look at Stockton and like Ruzitska, I I feel is going to be in the NHL on the Flames next year. I think Jacob Pelte is going to be in the NHL on the Flames next year from start of training camp. So that having guys like Manjapane, Dubé, Ruzitska, and Pelte in your bottom nine, like that, you've got a really good group of young fast forwards coming in and you know supplementing them with guys like Toffoli like Backlund like Coleman like now you're starting to see some of the depth and the speed that teams like a Colorado have and you know like the the roster starts looking like oh this might be a cup team and you know, it, the, and I think that was one of the things that this particular iteration of this team was lacking was a little bit of foot speed and, you know, like moving away from like the fourth line as it was and, you know, getting some youth and more speed in the organization and spreading the wealth a little more will help, you know, and especially because of the fact that they have so many good young skill guys that you can kind of spread skill line one through four and Sutter's system of rolling the lines makes a lot more sense at that point. I think for the first time, I feel like the people in the depth roles are less important and that we've defined what the role is, if that makes sense. Like yeah. we talked about this with Zadorov. I think we finally realized we need this type of player where before it just felt like we were putting a bunch of people on the ice and hoping it was going to be successful. And I think now we, we know how to cast the team for the lack of a better term. Yeah. And you know, it also, um, like, I think that this team also will need to learn how to play different ways a little bit more good and like different types of star players in different ways. Um, because like, I think that McDavid was entirely containable if they had played him the right way, but they didn't. And you know, like they're going to, you know, like say they play Colorado in the conference finals next year, you're going to have to figure out how to play McKinnon. Who's very much a McDavid like? You know player. what though, I have and no then, uh, doubt uh, uh, that next time the Flames encounter McDavid, he'll be handled differently. Oh yeah, 
and but then you know like uh, say with like a Colorado like Rantanen is a completely different player or Landis Cog is a completely different player you need to be able to figure out ways of playing each type of guy in order to be successful and learning tac- uh, better tactics and being able to si- have more situational awareness which is one of the things I think the Flames have been lacking a little bit but you know that that but I think all that season. comes with being young and learning. Yeah, exactly. And like all of this is very teachable. And like now you're like, okay, this seems actually building towards being a contender instead of figuring things out and you know falling flat on their face because they're inexperienced and 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 like yep. they've got everything in the right order now. Let's go. Well, Matt, I think that wraps things up for the 2021-2022 season. Um, We don't know when our next show is going to be. The NHL entry draft this year is July 7th and 8th, so we'll probably do a show sometime in early July before the entry draft, and then, of course, something probably after the entry draft leading into free agency on the 13th. But I think for the month of June, our fans are going to have to find somebody else to fill their ear holes. Well, yeah, and plus, like, uh, normally, like, we do a very in-depth, draft preview but you know when we're missing a first a second i think a third a fifth you know we're not going to be too busy on draft day no so i mean we may not even be here before draft day maybe after draft day but we're going to wait and see kind of what flames news shakes down if you know there's well essentially we'll be back when there's something to talk about so keep following us on twitter at fireside podcast on facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat on our website, firesidechat.ca, um, and we will notify you when the next episode's coming up because right now there's a lot that we don't know. So uh, enjoy your summer, and I guess we'll talk to everyone when we're back. Yeah, and I do believe there's a development camp this year, which if that's the case and you know, like people can actually attend it, we'll be there. And, 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 and you know, as the off season rolls along and, you know, We'll be covering anything important and all that fun stuff and looking forward to the next step that this team will take. And hopefully it's a good one. And I hope to see number 13 back next year. And, you know, I think that most Flames fans would agree. And, you know, hopefully, you know, this is a step in a linear progression instead of, like, the sort of a quasi rebuild ish, but not which would I be a, feel, a disappointment. <laughs> I feel the most excited going to this off season that I have in a while. Yeah. It's just that particular contract definitely needs to get done. Well, Matt, have a, have a great summer and we will talk to you soon. Yep. And our next episode will be episode number 300. So it will be nice to start a new century of shows with, the start of a uh, the Flames next cup winning season. Not too optimistic for next year or anything. <laughs> anyway, as always, go Flames go. And abs, because Oilers suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.